On the 19th of May 1845, the HMS Terror and the HMS Erebus set sail from Kent. Under the leadership of Sir John Franklin, their goal was to find the Northwest Passage, thereby solidifying Britain's mastery of the sea. However, the expedition was to become one of the 19th century's most tragic losses. 129 men were lost and for centuries, information on their fate was scarce. Piece by piece, details gradually have started to unfold. In this series, I will explore the details of the ill-fated voyage. Ah, for just one time, I would take the Northwest Passage to find the hand of Franklin reaching for the Beaufort Sea. Tracing one warm line through a land so wide and savage and make a northwest passage to the sea. In 1845, Sir John Barrow was making yet another appeal for a mission to discover the Northwest Passage. As second head of the Admiralty, he'd already funded many of her efforts, all to no avail. In furious determination, he planned, equipped and raised funds for this final push in a mere three months. By the mid-19th century, the Admiralty were growing weary of Arctic exploration. Explorers such as James Clark Ross, John Buck and William Perry had already made attempts at conquering the Arctic and all had ended in either disaster or mediocre achievement. <laughs> Nevertheless, the plan was approved. The promise of the Northwest Passage was just too much to miss out on. Britain's empire depended on having mastery of the sea, not just for trading, but also for defence, as they had proved in the Opium Wars not too long before. Furthermore, discovery of the Northwest Passage and thus control of it would promise that trading routes with China would be far easier and more cost-effective. There was also a great deal more faith invested in this expedition than the others before it. Basing its routes on previous maps charted by those before, it stood a far greater chance of discovering the Northwest Passage once and for all. Not only that, but it also was the most technically advanced expedition of its time. The HMS Terror and the HMS Erebus, the two ships chosen for the endeavour, had once been to the Arctic before, under the command of James Clark Ross. Both of them were former naval bombing vessels, which had been redesigned to withstand the harsh conditions of the Arctic. The hull and the stern were reinforced with iron plates to withstand the pack ice. They also featured screw propellers and iron rudders that could be protected by capsules to avoid damage. Each ship would also feature a state-of-the-art water filtration system, which would pump seawater through heated pipes and convert it into drinking water, even in the freezing temperatures. A great amount of attention was also paid to the crew's own comfort. There were heating systems for the bunks, which would operate off residual heat from the cooking stove. Additionally, there was also a vast library and costumes supplied so they could entertain themselves. It was also to be one of the most well-stocked missions of its time. Previously, the public had looked on with horror at the stories of sailors suffering from starvation, scurvy, or even in the most dire circumstances, resorting to eating the corpses of their comrades. Therefore, this expedition prided itself on having three years' worth of good food, the majority of which was canned, which would make it last longer, and that was vital on an expedition into the Arctic where restocking would be completely impossible. To further prevent the risk of scurvy, 930 gallons of lemon juice were taken. This was standard issue for the Royal Navy, and had been for decades. In fact, this is where the term limey comes from, as lemon and lime were interchangeable in the era. But of course, this grand expedition needed a leader. And although John Barrow had a good idea of who he wanted to take control, he found that he had to make many compromises. His first choice, of Sir James Clark Ross, had grown weary of the Arctic. Just two years before, he'd taken the Erebus and Terror further south than any man before and rejected the offer of a second mission. 
Barrow was therefore left with Sir John Franklin, and although a third choice, he certainly had a rich resume. Now nearing 60, he was the veteran of three Arctic expeditions, as well as the former governor of Tasmania. He'd received various accolades for his work, such as the knighthood from George IV, as well as a gold medal from the French Society of Geography. He also had the respect and admiration of those who worked alongside him. Men such as Joseph Dalton Hooker wrote of him, He is in all respects a good man and an ornament of his profession as a Christian and a sailor. The Victorian administration also lent a hand in boosting Franklin's popularity among his men and the public. As a man of gentlemanly class and a prominent figure in high society, they styled him as a hero and a maverick. His journals and letters from the expeditions were widely published in popular magazines, and he could often be found at high society functions speaking favourably of the Navy and its endeavours. The press even painted his failures in a positive light, such as his 1819 expedition to the Arctic, which resulted in the death of several men and the crew having to eat through the leather of their own boots in order to survive, thus earning Franklin the teasing yet affectionate title of the man who ate his own boots. Upon his return home with the rest of the crew, he was treated as a hero and a survivor, and subsequent missions back to the Arctic earned him the favourable title of Lion of the Arctic. This was also within the long-standing Victorian tradition of making heroes of their explorers and innovators. This promised further funding for future missions, as well as presenting public figures to represent England on the main stage. The superpower of innovation and advancement for mankind. Whilst Franklin would be the overall leader of the expedition, the Terror also needed a captain. This was Francis Crozier. Crozier was somewhat of an oddity in the Victorian Navy. He was skilled, knowledgeable, and had a great deal of experience, even having served as second-in-command to James Clark Ross on many of his missions. However, a few things held him back from reaching his full potential. Firstly, his heritage posed a problem. He was Irish and born into a middle-class family, which by all accounts made him feel alienated among the other high-ranking officers. Many historians consider that Crozier's background may have caused him to hit a glass ceiling in his career. Whilst it is true that there was a heavy anti-Irish settlement at the time, it is also important to consider Crozier's personality. By his own admission and reputation, he was melancholic. In letters and journals, he was often brutally honest about this fact, as well as frequently writing about the darker aspects of life at sea. This led to a vicious cycle. Crozier would feel out of place among his comrades and thus avoid contact and limit his social circle. During his service, he only managed to maintain a few friends that he maintained contact with, such as his two-decade-long friendship with James Clark Ross. He also disliked attending social functions, only going out of obligation. He even disliked attending officers' dinners while serving on ships, and often tried to find excuses to dine alone. And although he proved himself time and time again, even beyond his station, as he was able to gather valuable scientific research into magnetism and coastal mapping, he himself had a very low perception of himself, claiming in one letter to Ross that he didn't enjoy staying at home for too long, as he felt that he was a burden upon his sisters. With all these factors considered, we can begin to understand why Crozier's career reached a glass ceiling. Because of the cult of personality that surrounded the leaders of the Victorian military, Crozier was simply not marketable to the public and therefore could excel no further. The final leading officer we shall consider is James Fitzjames, who was appointed commander of the Erebus. Although, as mentioned before, Barrow lost the chance to have him as leader of the expedition, he succeeded in having him installed as commander. Barrow had first met Fitzjames years beforehand when he had been serving as a volunteer on one of the ships that he observed. 
and although their contact was limited, they built a strong bond and respect for one another. Some argue that the commitment that Barrow had to Fitzjames's career was the result of Fitzjames having saved George Barrow, only surviving son of John Barrow, whilst they were both serving in Shanghai in 1841. Whilst the nature of the scandal is unknown, it is evident that Fitzjames spent a great deal of his own money and risked his reputation in order to save George. It is therefore not hard to imagine that Barrow may have been indebted to Fitzjames. However, this assumption is unfair as it may discredit Fitzjames's career and many achievements in his short term. By the age of 32, Fitzjames had already proven himself to be charismatic and adaptable. He'd already served in the Opium Wars, having led four land-based assaults. And in the years prior, he served on board a number of flagships in the Mediterranean and the Americas, aimed to represent British political interests, most significantly of which was the transport of Otto of Bavaria to the New Kingdom of Greece for his coronation, which involved a tour of Italy and other parts of the Mediterranean before landing in Greece. Whilst on board, Fitzjames wrote a weekly newspaper in order to entertain Otto and the rest of the crew, and he became famous for his wit and humour. He was also skilled in languages, speaking Portuguese, French, Italian and Spanish fluently, which won him favour with captains during tours of the Mediterranean. Public favour was also on his side, as he won a reputation as a hero, not only for his service in the wars, but also for saving a man from drowning whilst restocking a boat in the River Mersey in Liverpool, for which the city honoured him with a golden cup. In terms of Fitzjames's career, this mission could have been the final push to bring him to becoming the next high-ranking officer and sealing his fate in British naval history. Further trust can be seen in Fitzjames's capabilities as Barrow trusted him with the scientific observations and the recruitment for the mission. Fitzjames certainly had no problem with the recruitment. He had made many contacts in his years in the Navy and was able to recruit many capable men, including some that he had served with in the Opium Wars. The scientific research aspects, however, were a little bit more controversial. The main mission was to record shifts in polar magnetism Although he had kept a journal of coastal and weather observations whilst on previous voyages, this was completely new territory for him. However, Francis Crozier had spent many years studying magnetism in the Arctic. And traditionally, the roles of recruitment and scientific observations were usually given to the second captain rather than the commander. This is likely more evidence of Barrow's attempt to further Fitzjames's career potentially earn him more notoriety. With the command in place, all that remained was marketing the mission. Newspapers struck deals so that they'd report on the progress of the mission regularly. Grand dinners and balls were held in honour of the men, serving as a way to prove to the investors that their financial investment was worth it, and to furthermore strengthen their personal faith in the men. In order to fully understand how society perceived these men, we can compare them to the astronauts of the 1960s. They too were heading into the unknown when no man had been before. However, voyaging into the unknown is dangerous and unpredictable. Although they had every faith in the Franklin expedition and predicted it would only last a year, tragedy was to strike in the worst possible way, claiming the souls of all men involved. In the next part of this series, we will be exploring the fate of the men and the factors that led to this mission being one of the worst disasters in British polar exploration.